Okay, everyone, let's get started. Good afternoon. Uh, were there any problems in the lab last week? Did everyone get lab one finished and submitted okay? Uh, I talked to the TAs. They said it went pretty smoothly. A couple of small hiccups. Um, uh, I sent an email last week about the lab sheet. Had a few bugs in it that I fixed. So when I calculated the values in the lab sheet, like the test values, I calculated them by hand in MATLAB. And I didn't realize that the rounding was a little different. So a few of you got were off by one or two. And then, uh, and then I also sent out an Excel spreadsheet that basically implemented the algorithm in a spreadsheet. And I, the Soyash mentioned that there was a few questions about the, the results from the program being off by one from, the, from the, the spreadsheet. That still confuses me because that shouldn't be the case unless there's a bug in the spreadsheet. The, the, the spreadsheet algorithm as far as I know, should match the algorithm that you implement in, in RARS. So I'm still, if there's something going on there, I'm still trying to track that down. Okay. Um, but as far as I know, other than that, I think we're in good shape. So we have lab two ready and we'll start that in lab uh, this week. Okay. Um, also, there's a quiz that's on Dropbox. It's due on Friday. Make sure you don't forget to take that. That will cover uh, the risk five material and material I'll cover today. Okay, so today we're going to talk about logic circuits and system Verilog. So in 212, uh, sorry, 211 rather, uh, hopefully you guys did some work with Boolean algebra. And when you, the reason you learn Boolean algebra is because that can be used to define the behavior of a digital logic circuit. You know, so Boolean algebra is kind of a mathematical concept, but it just so happens that it, it can be used to describe the functionality of a circuit, of a digital logic circuit. And that, so that's, that's usually called the behavioral representation of the circuit if you write it out in Boolean logic. It's one way to represent behavior. And that's the way you used in the, the, to, to do it in, in um, 211. So basically what I'm trying to say is that Boolean algebra is the way essentially that you represented a program that was implemented in hardware in 211, right? Uh, and then you also should have done some work with a structural design, which is where you build a block, uh, sorry, a schematic or a block diagram, a schematic that consists of these shapes and lines where the shapes represent gates, lines represent wires. And the idea is that you can take this behavioral description and you can implement it with a schematic, a Boolean logic schematic. And so the Boolean logic is typically, or sorry, the um, schematic is, is called the structural representation. And what's meant by that is it's, it's still a logical representation. It's not physical, but it represents things that do exist in the physical world, these logic gates, right? Except the problem is, is that it's still kind of abstract because you just have these logic gates connected by wires. You haven't really defined how you're going to build the logic gates or where they are, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the physical implementation, which is where you take the structural and for each one of these gates or for each one of these shapes, you have to actually allocate some physical entity, whether it be a chip, or a slot on a chip, as hopefully you would have done in 211, All right? Use these chips with four slots, four gates. No, you should, you should have at some point, or I guess they don't do this anymore, but you can take this and you can deploy it on a breadboard by buying these gates from, I guess, Amazon now. I almost said Radio Shack. Um, so you buy these things, you put them on the board, you wire them up, and what you're doing here is associating each one of these logical <coughs> shapes with a physical device on a breadboard, right? That's the physical representation. So in this class, we're going to be doing the same thing. We're just going to be using a more practical way to do this. So the behavioral representation is no longer Boolean logic. It's now going to be a high-level programming language called System Verilog. And there's several of these high-level programming languages, uh, hardware description languages, HDLs. Sometimes they're called RTLs, Register Transfer Language. It all refers to the same thing. Now, what's really happening here, though, 
is it's not as if you're writing loops in this language and somehow circuits are gonna run a loop, right? It's not exactly what's going on. You're writing code that is, it's, you run it through a program called a synthesizer, a logic synthesizer, which is kind of like a compiler, basically. And it's gonna convert that into Boolean logic, essentially. It's just, you don't wanna to have to design the Boolean logic by hand. This is really just automating the process of building that Boolean logic, right? And it's also gonna handle the minimization. You guys remember, hopefully in 2.12, you guys talked about minimization where you use Carnot maps to kind of minimize, minimize the circuit, simplify it, but still get the same behavior. That's all done in that CAD tool that's synthesized. That's done for you. That's all under the hood now, right? You don't have to worry about that. You write some, this, you write in this bizarre language and it will essentially convert it and minimize it down into Boolean logic for you. Okay, and then the output of that is stored as a, uh, as a structural design, which is sometimes called a net list, but it's really just a graph. It's, it's just modules that are connected with wires, just like in graph is a, you have nodes and, and edges, right? So, um, so you go, you, you synthesize, the tool synthesize that into the structural design. Now, generally speaking, the structural design is too complicated to ever, you'll never look at it. It's there. In fact, you can actually open it in Cordis, which is the synthesizer we use, but you'll never look at it because it's just massively complex. Because the types of, the types of schematics you get from HDLs are just huge, right? So sometimes you look at it. In fact, some groups in this class um, on their own came up with this idea where they get some of the debugging done by looking at these schematics. I don't know how they do it. You know, they, they figure out some bugs sometimes by digging through the schematics. That's not generally what I, the way I do it. I just use simulation, right? Um, and then what do we do then? Well, do you put these into uh, on a breadboard? No, you can, it's, again, it's, they're, too, they're too big to put on a breadboard. Breadboards would be enormous. So instead we use a, a, an FPGA, a field programmable gate array, which is basically equivalent to a breadboard, except the difference is instead of having to allocate gates inside those little chips and then put the chips on the breadboard and then wire them by hand, it's done electronically on a large grid of gates uh, and they're all connected with a programmable interconnect. So basically they use transmission gates, with, which is just a, a, a P and an N transistor in parallel, which allows you to basically connect two sides of wire or disconnect two sides of wire. And that's essentially the principle that's, and then that's, that connection, that, that configuration is, just in a, is, is, is put in a uh, flip-flop. So you have a flip-flop that stores a bit, that bit goes into the transmission gate, which either d disconnects or connects a gate to these wire tracks that are allocated in the, in the fabric, right? So basically, you use another compiler, which is called a place and route tool, that takes each one of these logical blocks and places them onto a physical block, which is actually a little slot on the FPGA. And then it, that's the placement process. And then routing is where it allocates the wire tracks. You, generally there's vertical and horizontal route, routing tracks. And you have to make one connection to a vertical, one connection to a horizontal, and that will complete one wire between two endpoints, two gates, right? So, that's basically the process. It's the same thing you did in two, or hopefully that you should have done in 2.11 with the breadboards. It's just on a much larger scale now. That's the only difference. So you have these three representations. Um, okay. Oh, by the way, the FPGA we use in class is this one. Um, we, we're now using these things in three classes because we're really getting our money's worth out of these things. But um, this has an FPGA with 115,000 gates on it. So you can imagine that's, you know, that, that gives you a, uh, you can build a pretty big design with 115,000 gates. And this is actually a small one. The biggest FPGAs um, are about 10 million gates. It's the big, biggest one. Um, but these ones are pretty impressive for, you know, um, for being an embedded FPGA. Okay, so uh, embedded meaning it's like, you know, not, a, not on a big board. Um, okay, so... Uh, this is this I, I showed this slide already. I'm going to skip over this one. Okay, so what's the deal with these HDLs then? Uh, HDL meaning hardware description language. That's the language we're learning in class. Uh, you know, how is this different from Java or C++? Well, basically, the, the idea with these is that um, there's three concepts that they're that they're built around: um, abstraction, hierarchy, and regularity. 
Um, abstraction is where the idea is, is that you want to be able to take a design and if you look at any one file, any one module, right, they're relative, they look relatively simple. And you might say, well, you know, that looks, you might look at a system Verilog file and say, well, that's not that long. It's only like 50 lines long. Um, but there's a lot of complexity hidden in that because of abstraction. You know, typically when you look at a, a a file, it instantiates other modules in there, and then those modules instantiate other modules and so on, right? And so the idea is you're trying to hide as much complexity as you can by decomposing your design into, into modules. In, into, and it's the same idea that you use with an object-oriented programming language too, right? You're trying to hide complexity. Uh, and then hierarchy is the same sort of idea. In fact, abstraction and hierarchy are basically the same thing. Hierarchy is just the idea that you have, uh, you start out with a top level design, which is the root, your design root. And inside that root, you've got things instantiated. You've got modules instantiated in there. And then those, and those modules are the more subtract ones. And then you drill down into the mo those modules and you have slightly less ones. And then you go into those and slightly uh, less abstract and so on until you get to the leaves of the tree, which are logic gates and flip-flops. Because fundamentally, when, when you boil everything down, that's basically all you have with digital logic design is logic gates and, uh, and flip-flops, which are, and then there's also RAMs and IO pins, IO buffers and that kind of stuff, which are little amplifiers to send signals off chip. But it all, it, it, at the leaf nodes of the tree, at its most fundamental, at its least abstract, you have these, the same basic things you talked about in 2.11, right? And then regularity is where you try to design that minimizes the number of unique modules. So you can leverage the reuse on modules. So you design modules to be reused as much as possible because then you don't have to write that many modules, many different ones, right? Now this is, this is something that is really up to you though as a designer. So a lot of students will ask like, okay, I'm designing the CPU should I put the control unit in a module or should I just inline it, put the code for the control unit just in the CPU design? Or should I, should I take that code and package it into a module? In other words, should I outline it? You guys ever heard the word inline and outline? So in programming languages, inlining a function is when you replace the call to a function with the code that that function would, would execute. That's called an inline, right? An outline is when you take code and you move it into a function and replace it with a call to that function, right? So it's the same kind of idea is that you have to decide what you wanna put into, into modules in, in Verilog and you wanna do that in a way that maximizes the reuse of those modules. So you wanna try to boil everything down so you, uh, in a way where you have the, the minimum number of unique designs that you have to deal with. Okay, so here's an, ex here's an example that kind of shows this. So your CPU, uh, might be the top level. In fact, that's what it'll be in this. Well, actually, that's not true. We'll have a, we'll have the FPGA design will be the top level, and then you'll have a CPU in there. And then the CPU, a typical CPU might be comprised of multiple processor cores. So you'll instance each core, and each one of those cores will be identical. They're just copies. They're basically four copies of the core, right? But then if you drill down into one of those processor cores, you may have, say, a floating point functional unit, for example, as well as register file and other things that make up a processor core, right? Now we're not doing fun we're not doing floating point in this class, but this is just a you know like a like a real processor. If you drill down into a a, a floating point function uh, a functional unit, um, you, you may have in there an adder, right? If it can do add, and then and you may also have a multiplier. So the adder and the multiplier are both inside that functional unit. If you drill into the adder, you'll have a comparator for comparing exponents, uh, a shifter for denormalizing one of the significants, right? And an adder for actually adding the significance in the floating point format, right? And then inside the comparator that compares the exponents, that's actually built around a subtractor, an integer subtractor. So you'll have a subtractor in there, and the subtractor, if you drill into that, that just has an adder, because in order to build a subtractor, you just add a number to the negative form of the second operand, right? So the, the subtractor has an adder in it, and the adder, if you drill in there, you'll get some full adders, which are single bit adders, right? And if you drill down to the full adders, you'll get gates, 
XOR gate, essentially. So this way you can see that after going through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine levels of hierarchy, you go all the way from a CPU all the way down to XOR gates. But all that complexity is built into this, this hierarchy, right? Make sense? But the hierarchy is, is purely for the convenience of human beings because when you synthesize, well, when you synthesize this, I think there's still hierarchy in the, in the, in the, in the net list. But eventually, when you convert this into a form that you deploy on the FPGA, it gets flattened. This hierarchy gets flattened. It just gets converted into one big mess. Because in reality, what this really boils down to is a mass of gates and wires, a big rat's nest of thousands or millions of logic gates connected with wires. This hierarchy is just, just the way that it's represented as a design. It doesn't actually matter for the real hardware. The real hardware is just a bunch, like I said, it's, it's everything is, there's no, there's no notion of hierarchy in the hardware. At some point when you bring it down to the, the, the physics, the physical system, it gets flattened, which is why, you know, you can see like when you do the, when you do like a, uh, a breadboard based design, you know, it always inevitably turns into a mass of, you know, chips and wires. You can't really make heads or tails of looking at that, which is why, you know, you can't, once you get it into the physical layer, you can't really debug it anymore. It's just a big mess. It's, it's, you, you, especially like if you ever looked at a layout of a, of a modern chip, it's, people like to take pictures of the, the layout, right? The, the, the way the physical chip looks. Like when you go to a conference, like the design automation conference, all of these big posters with pictures of chips and you look at it, it's just a bunch of mass of wires and shapes. No one can make any sense of that, but you're not supposed to because this making sense of it requires you to look at the HDL form of it, right? Okay, so let's, oh yeah, and by the way, the regularity part is notice that I tried to show like, for example, in an adder, you have multiple copies of a full adder and in the, in the processor, you have multiple copies of the functional unit, right? So you'll see a lot of repetition, a lot of copying, uh, and that's the regularity, right? So that's how chips could get so big. Like I used to always wonder, you know, when I was, in school, like people say, you know, like the latest Intel chip has uh, 10 million transistors on it. I'm like, who the heck wired those up? That's a, no one, no human being could do that. And it's true, no one could, because first of all, there autom there's automation there. You know, the tools are automating the, the layout of those transistors, but even the functional description of what those transistors does, there's a lot of copying in there. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of this regularity. There's a lot of you know, I'm gonna take multiple copies of this design and I'm gonna stamp them out. GPUs are famous for this because if you look at a GPU, you know, it's very easy to scale up a GPU design because GPUs are very regular designs. They take a, a core and they just stamp out a whole bunch of them and GPUs have many cores. It's a very uh, homogeneous style structured regular design. That's why there's so many different GPUs out there because it's very easy to take a GPU and just add more cores to it. Right. Whereas CPUs, on the other hand, are much more the harder to design because they're more irregular. They're more header. There's more diversity inside the design of a CPU. OK, anyway. So now let's quickly uh, review a few things. Um, when I talk about logic gates um, or logic circuits, um, a logic gate is a, um, a, a type of logic circuit. You guys remember that uh, you've got things like an inverter or a buffer and you can represent these in the functional form in Boolean logic. So for example, an inverter has a symbol that looks like that, and uh, it has a Boolean algebra um, functionality where you say the output Y is the logical complement of A, the logical complement is a bar. They never standardize this, by the way. Sometimes when you see Boolean algebra, they use a, a bar, sometimes they use a tick. There's different ways to show complement. Um, but anyway, um, and then you can also show that as a truth table, right? Okay, now generally when it comes to schematics, only the gates have these symbols. Once you start coming up in the hierarchy, these gates go away and you just end up with blocks, right? So the idea is, is that if you, if you drill down in the hierarchy to the bottom, you'll eventually see these gate symbols. But usually you don't see that because you're not always looking at the bottom level of the hierarchy, you're looking at someplace in between the top and the bottom, in which case you have just blocks, which is why they call those block diagrams, right? Okay, um, okay, then we have an AND gate, which is uh, you know two inputs, one output. Uh, the output is true only when both inputs are true. Uh, an OR gate, you know, AND gate and OR gate have those symbols and the, the Boolean logic is shown there. You guys remember this stuff? 
Okay, so just just want to make sure we're on the same page. Um, then we've got different types of gates: XOR, NAND, NOR, XNOR gate. And then you can have things like multiple input logic gates. Now, on an FPGA, um, you don't have fixed logic gates. What you have are LUTs, lookup tables. Those lookup tables uh, on this FPGA have five inputs, six, I don't remember. I don't remember what the cyclone has. It might be six input gates. But anyway, the, the, when I say 115,000 gates on an FPGA, what I'm talking about are reprogrammable gates, which are in the form of lookup tables. So what you do is you have five inputs and one output, and that gate is actually a lookup table, which is a RAM, it's a memory. And so basically what you do is you take the truth table for whatever gate you wanna put there that you wanna assign in that slot, and you load that truth table in as if it were a memory, where the inputs are the address and the output is the actual contents that you're storing in that memory. So that way you can create an arbitrary five input gate or six input, whatever the case may be. Different FPGAs have different numbers of inputs on their LUTs, depending on what FPGA technology you have. But basically you take these lookup tables and you assign them arbitrary Boolean uh, functions, right? But you're limited in the number of inputs, right? You're limited to five. Now, if you don't have five, you don't have to fill the whole LUT up. You can have less than the less, you can use less than the, the maximum number of inputs, but obviously you can't use more. If you need more, you're gonna have to build out into multiple gates, right? Build a circuit up, right? Okay, so, um, so, so a logic circuit, when I, whenever I say logic circuit, a logic circuit is um, a digital logic circuit where it's defined as having inputs, outputs, a functional specification, and a timing specification. Now you may wonder, well, what's, why, is this, uh, why is this conceptual stuff necessary? Because a logic circuit is actually um, maps into a module in System Verilog. And a module is almost kind of like a class in Java, right? So you've got, you, could, you have these inputs. Uh, when you define a module in System Verilog, you define your inputs and your outputs first. That's right at the top, right? And then um, inside the module is where you can have internal signals that are not visible outside the module. Right? So for example, this N1 signal is an internal signal. You could think of that like a private variable if this were a Java class, right? Um, and then normally these modules are basically just contain instantiations of other modules. So these E1, E2, E3 are instances of other modules, like, like objects that are inside that module. Um, and so most modules in System Verilog that you'll see in the wild are structural modules. In other words, they're basically just a, a module that has the inputs and outputs, and then inside is just essentially a schematic, but the schematic is written in text as opposed to graphics like this. This is a graphical representation, a block diagram, but everything you do in System Verilog is in, is in a text file, like a Java source code file. Now you might say, wait a second, hold on. Why in the world would anyone design a schematic in text when it really should be naturally displayed in this graphical schematic format, right? Engineers always use schematics, right? Um, yeah, there are actually tools that will allow you to enter a schematic and it'll just convert it to a textual format. And I'll show you how that works here in a minute. The problem, in fact, we used to use one in this class years ago, but we quit using it because no serious, serious engineers, um, you know, digital logic guys, they don't use that. They just use the text, right? And the other problem too is that if you get an error, the error message will reference a line in the text file. But if you have a schematic that can, gets automatically converted to text file, you don't know where the error is because it's pointing to line 27 and you don't know where line 27 is in this picture, right? So we made the decision like 10 years ago to just use the textual entry method, right? Okay, so um, another thing I wanted to review here is I don't know if you talked about this in 2.11 hopefully, but there's two types of logic circuits. Uh, there's combinational, logic and sequential logic. Combinational is where the outputs are a function only of the inputs. So this would be equivalent to just having logic gates with no memory, no memory cells, no, 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 no flip-flops or no latches or no RAMs, right? That's combinational logic. And so whenever any of the inputs change, the outputs 
are updated to reflect the change in the input, right? Now this is where things get weird because a digital logic circuit is going to have a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of these elements, a bunch of these um, combinational logic. You could think of them as like, um, you know, circuits that evaluate an output. Combinational logic circuits, right? And they're all operating concurrently. They're all they're they're, they're circuits. Like basically, anytime an input changes, the corresponding output will change very soon thereafter, regardless of where that logic circuit is in your source code. Right. So what in, what we end up with is a system Verilog file, which looks like a looks like a the language looks like MATLAB or like a cross between MATLAB and Java and Python, basically. But it uses concurrent semantics. Every line of that file is representing one of these combinational or sequential logic circuits, and so you can scramble the order of the, the lines, and it, it makes no difference because what you're doing is describing a circuit, right? Uh, and then, of course, sequential logic is where you have memory, so that's where you involve a memory element like a flip-flop or RAM, and in that case, the output is a, is a function of the inputs and you know whatever the history of the inputs were, right? Okay, so um, okay, so um, yeah, so if combinational circuits are comprised just of logic gates, and the only thing you have to be careful with these is you don't have any cycles, right? If the, the other way, the other way to keep, create sequential logic is if you have a cycle from the output feeding back into the input, uh, and you have to, you know, in the case of um, you, you don't typically design sequential logic, at least not in Verilog, uh, in that way. You usually just use the elements, the the, the building block elements like flip flops or RAMs, right, to create sequential logic circuits. Okay, so when you're reading these schematics. Uh, these block diagrams or schematics, uh, there's a few, you, you have to get used to reading them, obviously. Um, when you first look at them, they can be confusing. Um, and one of the strange things about them is the wires. So schematics are kind of hard to, to show, actually, because when you have a group of, you have a group of nodes that are connected by wires, you can lay those out any way you want. Right, and there's there's some ways that you can lay them out that sort of reduce the amount of crossings, wire crossings, right? And then there's some ways you can lay out a schematic that sort of shows the inputs coming in from the left and sort of flowing to the right, but they don't have to be laid out like that, right? So that's that's another reason why, by the way, if you compile your your code in Cordis and you look at the schematic it generates, it's really hard to read because it's just machine generated, right? It's there's no human artistry there to try to to try to lay those out okay but when you're reading one of these things um, one of the things that's a little confusing is the notation so whenever you have two wires that connected at T junction like this it's implied that they're connected right um, and it, but if you have two wires that cross like this they're not connected right because what ends up happening is that you're gonna end up with a lot of crossing wire. Well, generally, if you have enough modules in there, enough nodes in your design, you're gonna you're gonna end up with these crossing wires, right? And so it's it's hard to avoid that. You want to try to minimize it. But if two wires do cross, you assume that they're not connected unless there's a a bubble there, right? But if you have this T junction, then of course they yeah. must be connected, right? Because why else would you have that if if not to show that these were connected, right? And the only other option would be what this this wire is just a stub not connected to anything, right? So if you see a T junction, they're connected. If you see a bubble, they're connected. But if there's just a cross, they're not connected, okay? Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is that um, in this class, the objective is to design a CPU. And so I'm gonna be describing to you how the CPU works, and I'm gonna be showing you the design of the CPU through schematics. And so your job basically is to take those schematics and convert them to System Verilog, and then then it's just a matter of compiling them, and the compiler does all the work of the synthesis, right? The, the synthesis, converting the, 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 the code to gates, and then taking those gates and putting them on the FPGA and connecting them all up. That's all done automatically. You don't have to worry about that. All you essentially have to do in this class is take my schematics and convert them to system Verilog. Um, so if that's really what we're trying to um, cover in, in, in this class, at least the first, the first half. Okay, okay. so one of the things also that comes up often with these things is 
Uh, whenever you have a wire, so, so let me back up here a minute. So in Verilog, when you have a variable in Verilog, it's a wire. So you've got inputs and outputs, which are variables, essentially, symbols. And then you've got internally declared symbols, variables. Th those, are, those are wires too, right? So basically what you do is whenever you have a, a named variable, it's, it represents a wire. The problem is, is that any logic circuit that sets a value on that wire or that's responsible for setting the wire, like we call it driving, any circuit that drives the wire is the owner of that wire. Because if you have another circuit that drives the same wire, there's the potential of a, of a contention, which is where you have, if you have a, a logic gate that's driving a wire and it tries to pull it up to VDD, to one, the logic one, and another circuit is trying to pull it down to logic zero, but down to ground, what you end up with is a short circuit, which will, uh, as my former grad student used to say, it, it'll um, release the magic smoke, meaning that the chip is fried. Because um, transistors, uh, have a, you know, they have a, um, a very low on resistance, right? So when you're pulling up, when you're trying to connect an output to VDD and connect another output to ground, it creates a low resistance path, right? So you end up sinking a bunch of current through that path. So it puts the signal into contention, which means it goes basically be a voltage between logic one and logic zero, uh, which is the forbidden zone. It's not defined in Boolean, right? Um, and because of that large amount of current that flows, uh, it can cause a lot of heat. It'll heat up and burn out the chip, right? So you can only have one driver for each variable, right? However, you can have a lot of circuits that read that wire. So that's called, that's basically called fan out. Fan out is when you have one circuit that sets a value, but then it kind of branches off and goes to a bunch of inputs on other logic circuits, that's fine, as long as only one, there's only one driver. Now the problem is, is that how do you know if you're accidentally double driving a wire? Well, if you try to synthesize a circuit that, that does that, you'll get an error. Synthesizer will give you an error. Um, but one of the things I didn't mention is when you synthesize, it takes a long time. It's not like compiling software. Synthesis and place and route take a long time because the, every th all three of those steps are NP complete. They're all combinatorial problems. They're all exponential problems. You guys, so you guys remember from 2.11 when you did the Carnot maps, there was often more than one solution to the Carnot map, right? <laughs> And if you, and you guys just did, did small ones, right? When you, when you do a big Carnot map, there can be a lot of solutions, right? In fact, there's an exponential number of solutions. Um, and then when you're choosing which of the logical gates from your schematic to put on the physical slots on the FPGA, well, there's an exponential number of ways you can do that too. Likewise, when you're allocating the wires, when you're deciding how to route the wires, right? Through the, through the little grid of wires that you can attach to, horizontal and vertical wires you can attach the driver and the receivers to. There's an exponential number of ways to do that. But also, in order to get your clock speed as high as possible, in order to, to minimize the worst case timing delay, the worst case path, the critical path delay, um, you, it's actually an optimization problem where you're trying to cluster together um, not nodes that are connected, right? Because you want to shorten the paths between them, right? You want to minimize the path lengths. And so all of this takes a while. In this class, uh, on these FPGAs and with the designs you guys have, it's not too bad. It's about five to 10 minutes per compile. But the problem is, is even then, that's too slow for you to iterate on your design. It's too slow for you to, to, to go through a cycle where you modify your code and test, debug, modify your code, test, and debug. It takes too long. So instead, you're gonna be using a simulator, right? And in the simulator, if you double drive a signal, it becomes an X value. So normally the variables in system Verilog are Boolean, they're, they're zero or one, right? Um, but then there's a third value of X 
X means don't know, contention, right? And then there's also a fourth value called Z, which means that there's no driver. No one's driving this. Z means high impedance. It means that there's no circuit that's pulling that wire either to power or to ground, to zero or to one. And so it's just kind of floating there, right? It's not, it's not energized, right? That's called high impedance. So system Verilog uses a, what they call a four state logic. There's Z, which means high impedance, X, which means conflict or don't know or don't care. <laughs> we'll get to that. X means can mean different things in different contexts. And then of course you have zero and one. Now system Verilog also has varying drive strengths for zero and one. They have a strong one and a weak one and a strong zero and a weak zero, but that's, don't worry about that. That's outside the scope of this class. We're not gonna deal with that. We're only gonna deal with the four states, zero, one, don't know, and, and high impedance Z, right? You guys with me? So you're saying like there's also high and low for each of those, but they're just they're all Yeah, there, there's different drive strengths. Yeah, you, it's, the only reason I bring it up is you might notice in the simulator, sometimes it'll say like if you, if you set something in the simulator, it'll say ST1. You're like, what's ST1? ST1 means strong one. It just means it'll overpower a weaker one, but that's, we're not gonna deal with that. Um, that just complicates things even more. Uh, in real life though, um, you know, there's just zero or one, right? They're binary signals, right? But in the simulator, you have these other options that are designed to help you debug your circuits and find problems. Okay, um, right, uh, and there's Z. Okay, I just talked about that, right? Okay, um, and by the way, the reason why you have Z is if you do wanna have multiple circuits that drive the same wire, you can make it so they don't drive it at the same time. You can time multiplex it and you can use Z for that. So that way you can have one module setting the value of a wire and you can have the other ones disengage with it with a tri-state buffer and drive Z. But we're not gonna, I just bring this up because it's basic Verilog. We're not gonna actually use that in, in the designs in this class. Okay, everyone with me so far? Any questions? Okay, so I know I'm going fast, but I'm gonna circle back on most of this stuff when I start showing examples. Okay, so hardware description language is, uh, it's been around for since the early 80s. And believe it or not, there's really only two that are in widespread use, which might seem unbelievable, right? Because pr think about pr how many programming languages are there? Tons. How can there be only two hardware description languages? Well, there is more than two. Uh, there's one out of Berkeley that's gaining some traction called Chisel. Um, there was one out of MIT that kind of fizzled out. It's called BlueSpec. But, but VHDL and Verilog are still the two, they, they still have, both nearly have about 50% market share. Uh, Verilog is generally more used in industry and VHDL is generally more used in academia. We used to teach VHDL, but we switched to Verilog because that's what the companies are all using. And most of you guys are gonna go to companies, work at companies, right? So we switched to Verilog, but they're very similar. If you learn one, you can very quickly pick up the other because they both have equivalent constructs. So just to give you a little bit of history here, uh, it's kind of fascinating how these started out. So VHDL was first. And VHDL is based on, um, it's based on Pascal. If any of you have seen Pascal. Uh, Pascal is unique in that it is case insensitive and it's verbose. So like when you declare an array, you actually have to type out array. When you declare a function, you have to type out function, right? It's designed to be self-documenting. So when you read it, it's, it's more readable, right? Because it's verbose, but it's a pain in the butt to write, to type all that stuff out. No one wants to type out function. No one wants to type out, you know, all this extra extraneous text, right? Um, so that's why I don't like VHDL. Verilog, on the other hand, is, is closer what, to what you guys are used to, case-sensitive language, and it's kind of like C and C++ and, and, and even Python. It's very sparse, right? Kind of hard to read, though, right? It's a downside. Okay, so but VHDL was first, and this is cool. I like this story. So it came out of the, de the, the Defense Department. So the U.S. military buys a lot of custom chips, or at least they did back in the 70s. So, you know, they didn't have a lot of things where you could just buy an off the shelf Intel processor to put it in an Abrams tank to control the turret. You just you couldn't do that. 
you had to buy a custom processor for the turret on the Abrams tank. So they would go out to these vendors and they would say, well, we need a processor that controls the turret. And they would have to describe what it, what it does in English prose, like just talk, write a paragraph on what the chip should do. But it's, that's not very concise. That's not very, there's a lot of room for interpretation if you're trying to describe the behavior of a chip that you're sending to a vendor to design, but you're describing it in English language. That, that's, I mean, think about it. How would you do that, right? How would you catch all the corner cases and the different behaviors of the chip? So the DOD developed VHDL as just a way to concisely describe functionality of a chip. It's a, it's a, it's a recursive acronym that stands for VISIC HDL. Uh, HDL is hardware description language. VISIC stands for Very High Speed Integrated Circuit. Um, and so it started out where, you know, instead of writing an English paragraph describing how this processor works that controls the turret, you would just describe it in, in this language, and, which is like a programming language, and that would much more accurately describe what the chip does, right? And then eventually, they came up with tools that could simulate the, the, the VHDL, or even compare like, like devices that would take the chip from the vendor, you plug it into a socket, and then you run the, next to it, you run the VHDL simulation and you compare. You compare the output of the chip to the output of the simulation, and then you can guarantee that they, it works as designed or as intended, right? That way you can keep these defense contractors honest, right? That was the whole idea. But then later on, people said, wait a minute, why not just write a compiler that'll take the VHDL and actually generate the whole chip design, right? Then you just basically have a computer design the chip. You don't need the defense contractor guys drawing it out manually, right? Might as well. And that's what they did. So they first came out with the simulators and they came out with the synthesizers, right? Um, and so it was adopted as an IEEE standard in 1987 and it's been updated throughout, throughout the years. Meanwhile, there's another language called Verilog, um, and that one came out, VHDL was 1981, originally 1981, Verilog was three years later, and that one came out of industry. So you can kind of see why I mentioned, you know, v Verilog is in more, in, even to this day, Verilog tends to be more industrial, whereas VHDL is used by academics, universities. Um, it kind of traces back to their beginnings. It was developed by a company that was eventually gobbled up by uh, uh, Synopsys, one of the big CAD companies, as, as, as they usually do. Uh, and it became an IEEE standard in 1995. Mm -hmm. So it was actually lagged behind VHDL by about eight years. But Verilog is a better language. I mean, there's no doubt. I, I, it's a it's much, much, much nicer language to use. Um, now, now it's called System Verilog because they, it's System Verilog is one of the updates. They've been constantly updating it because they keep building in a lot of testing functionality. Chips are hard to test. And so you have a language where a tiny piece of the language is, is, is where you design the actual hardware with, a subset. And then there's a superset of the language that is used just for testing and simulation, but it's not synthesizable. So there's a lot of things you can do in Verilog and VHDL that cannot be converted to hardware, compiled down to hardware, synthesized down to hardware, right? You can only simulate them, right? So if you're designing, if you're using this language for the purpose of designing hardware, you're kind of constrained on what feature of the language you can use. But if you wanna do some fancy testing stuff, right, to take a design that, you, that is intended to be hardware and then run it through this simulation framework, there's other things you can do in there. Like for example, reading files, right? You can't read a, you can read files in Verilog, but how would that work if it was in hardware? You, the hardware, the digital logic circuits can't read a file. They don't know what a file is, they don't, right? So you can like read files for getting test vectors, test cases, and then use that to send the data into the design under test, right? To test it, right? And we're gonna be doing that. We, that, that we, are, we are gonna be doing that uh, in this class. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so I mentioned there's simulation, there's synthesis, so just be aware of the difference there. Okay, so Verilog is built around modules, which is, think of it like classes in Java, and each module is a, the module is a unit that's used to leverage abstraction, regularity, 
and hierarchy, right? The whole reason we have module, modules in, is, is based to, to try to maximize um, the ability to generate massively huge digital logic circuits without a lot of typing by leveraging the hierarchy and the stuff I talked about earlier. And so um, how you organize your modules is, is important. Okay, so modules, by the way, um, inside a module, I mentioned modules start out with their input and output spec, right? And then they have their internal implementation. And by the way, in VHDL, they're called entities instead of modules, it's the same thing. Um, um, inside the module, you can have behavioral or structural code. Structural code is a schematic. Behavioral code is Boolean logic, basically right? Or like a state machine that can be mapped directly into a sequential logic circuit. You guys with me? As I mentioned, most times it's, most times as you're up in the hierarchy, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, structural, structural code. Okay, so here's some examples. So this module is called example. Typically modules are in their own file and the file names match the module name. You might be thinking, wait a second, that, that's three lines long. Like you're gonna put a three line lo long module in its own file? Yeah, yeah, that's how it works. That's weird. Um, so module, my example, and then you have your inputs and outputs, and then a semicolon, which is strange. There's no, notice there's no curly brace. There should be a curly brace there, right? But there's not, there's no curly braces. There are curly braces, but they're used for bit concatenation. They're not used for defining the beginning and end of a block. Okay, so the, the syntax takes a little get, getting used to. So um, let's take a look closer look. So you have input logic A comma B comma C. So first of all, you'll notice that uh, the data type of these things is called logic. Uh, logic is just logic, it's, it's binary. Um, there are other data types, but they're mainly used in non-synthesizable code. So if you're synthesizing the code, you're, you're going to be most likely using logic, right? There are a couple exceptions to that, but generally speaking, use logic, right? Um, and then notice that you've got A comma B comma C. So what's happening there? Well, you've got A and then B and C are inheriting the same type of A, right? You can't do that in C++ or Java, right? Normally you would have to say input logic A comma, input logic B comma, input logic C, if you're using like the C++ style, right? But in Verilog, that's optional. If, a, if B and C have the same type as A, then you just list them. Make sense? But then if you want to change the type, like I want, now I want to do output logic Y, then I have to say output logic Y. You guys with me? Now notice I put a, care, a new line, a line break after C, that's eh, optional. Um, in fact, most people will put a line break after each input to make it even more readable. Now you might say, wait a second, that just looks like a function, that looks like a method prototype, right? Yeah, it does, except modules in Verilog very often will have tons and tons of IOs. That's the problem, lots of them, much more than your methods will in Java. So that's why a lot of, a lot of people are kind of, um, they, they like to organize, they like to format these things in a, in a special way because there can be a lot of these things, a lot of IOs. This one is a small one. Okay, and then you've got at the bottom, you've got end module with no semicolon after it. So why do you have a semicolon after the module line and no semicolon after the end module mm -hmm. line? Uh, it's unclear, I don't know. I don't know why they do that. But if you put a semicolon after end module, you'll get a syntax there. And if you forget it after the module, you'll get a syntax there. And then inside there, we have just one line of code and it's an assign. So that one line of code is gonna create a, uh, a logic circuit it, that's combinational, no memory, and it's gonna assign Y as the output. So it's gonna own Y. You don't wanna have anything else drive Y. And it's gonna use, um, a and B, it's gonna reference A, B, and C multiple times, but this is just a Boolean logic statement. So this just creates a Boolean logic um, or Boolean, Boolean algebra expression, 
right? A function of A, B, and C. Make sense? Okay, so then how do you test this? Well, this is where it gets even crazier. Um, so they're tested in a, uh, this would be tested in a simulator, a discrete event simulator. And the, the reason I, I, I emphasize that is that the way the simulator works is this, this code uses concurrent semantics. So I mentioned that the order of the line, there's only one line, so it's a bad example, but there's only one line of code here. But if there were multiple lines of code, the order of those lines in the file would make no difference because each one is a circuit. And so anytime any of the inputs change, and by inputs I mean anything that's on the right hand side of the assignment statement, right? Anytime those change, Y will be updated, in this case, immediately, right? Now in reality, there's a delay. Real, real circuits have a delay, right? But, um, but we don't, we're not defining any delays here because this is, we're just defining the functionality. We're not incorporating the technology here that would cause there to be a, a capacitance and a resistance that would cause the logic to have a delay, okay? So anytime any of the inputs change, the output changes immediately. So you can't really run this through a, like run it at a shell prompt, like you can like a Java program. You have to simulate it in a simulator, and the simulator represents the state of each signal in a timing diagram, generally. A timing diagram is a plot that looks like an oscilloscope where the horizontal axis represents time and the vertical axis represents zero or one, right, for each of these signals. And then the signals are arranged vertically, right? So what's happening here is that A, B, and C are inputs and they're being driven by an unseen force, something outside this module, by some kind of test apparatus that's sending in values of A, B, and C. They're, they're sending an input stimulus, meaning that they're exercising this circuit by sending in values of A, B, and C. And those values are a counting sequence. You'll see that it starts out 0, 0, 0, and then it becomes 0, 0, 1 because C goes to 1, from 0 to 1. And then it goes 0, 1, 0, which is, you know, 2, right? Z because, because B has a rising edge and C has a corresponding falling edge at the same time, right? And then... Um, then you've got a rising edge here on C at this point in time, right? So basically, if you took a vertical line and drew it through this, that would be the state of the, va wherever that line intersects the signals would be the state of those signals at that moment in time, right? So you have to think of this like cut it through here and you have the signal. So if I cut it through here, I end up with a true and false value for A, B, and C and a corresponding value for Y. So essentially, this is a truth table. Right? It's just shown as a timing diagram. But what it's, go what it's doing is it's going through all the combinations of A, B, and C, right? It's going through 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Eventually 7 is where all three are high, right? right? So I'm going through all the possible inputs and then I'm looking at the corresponding output for Y and this is a way that I could test the circuit because I could then compare this Y to a truth table that I drew out ahead of time. Right? Does that make sense? Now, no one tests circuits like this, obviously, because if the more inputs you have, the number of input combination scales, you know, uh, is two to the power n, where n is the number of bits, right? So this is not going to scale up. But for this small circuit, I can do a brute forced exhaustive test, and where essentially I drive A, B, and C, I let that module take care of setting Y, and then I compare Y to what I expect Y to be, and hopefully it matches. Make sense? So that's the way uh, you run it. Um, let me see if I could do a real quick demo here of that. All right, so I am in Linux. Yes, I'm now in Linux via the magic of a virtual machine. Um, and so if I create a directory called foo, then I can create a example.sv. Wait, hold on, you guys can't read that. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, vim example.sv. Okay, so module example input logic abc output logic C, uh, y, y, semicolon and module. And then I can assign, ugh. Uh, set tab space for four. 
Yeah. Uh, I can assign y to be, what was it again? This. Can I copy that? Copy, paste. There we go. Okay, so there we go. And I'm going to exit. Okay, now when you want to run this, you're going to type, we're going to use a simulator. We're, going to, we're using a really powerful simulator in this class. Seriously, we're using QuestaSim. QuestaSim is actually the industry standard uh, logic simulator for this. This is what Intel AMD uses. There's no logic simulator more powerful than QuestaSim. Um, they give us, a, obviously, they give us an academic license for it. Um, a cheap, they give it to us cheap. Why? Because they want us to train you how to use it <laughs> so they can remain the leader, right? Um, so to run, so the first thing I, I need to do is I have to take the Verilog file and I have to compile it into a binary format that's read by the simulator. So for that, I use vlog. So I just type vlog example.sv, okay? And when you do that, it's going to create a, um, a library here called work, okay? And inside work, um, there's some, some crap in there that I can't read because it's all proprietary, right? So then I'll start vsim, which is the simulator. Okay, so once that opens up, it says, now this is what I was talking about, by the way, about the tools. Even though this is the most powerful tool for doing this available, it's still very user unfriendly. Um, so basically to use it, um, you want to so you want to say start simulation. And you'll see there's all these libraries here, but the one at the top is work. That's the one I actually use. All these other ones are the built-in libraries, right? That have simulation models of various types. So I'm gonna just select work, okay? And I'm gonna go to optimization off. I'm gonna say full visibility so I can see internal signal. Of course, there are no internal signals, so I guess that doesn't matter. Okay, so I hit okay on there. And as soon as I do that, it's gonna reconfigure this simulator. And you see it has all these uh, kind of panes in here. So on the left side is my design hierarchy, but the design hierarchy is flat. I just have example. I don't have anything instantiated in there, so I don't have anything really to look at over there. Here I've got my wires, and then this is for processes. This is for if you have uh, always blocks, which we'll talk about a little later. So I can take these signals here, A, B, C, and Y, and I can say add to wave, and you can see there's a waveform, right? And you can do, I know it's kind of hard to see there, um, but that's A, B, and C, and Y. And if I can hit this little button here, I can turn off the little prefixes. The reason the prefixes are there is sometimes you add signals from different levels of the hierarchy. So you have to have prefixes to let you know where it is, right? And then, um, and then you know, basically you can just run it, right? So you run it and there we go. So nothing's going on here because uh, a, B, and C, or Z, high impedance, because I never didn't set them anything. They're, they're, they're inputs, and there's nothing inside of this design to, to, to set them. Actually, if you did set them, it would give you an error. You say you can't drive an input, right? So, uh, and of course, Y, because Y is a Boolean logic function with Zs as inputs, it's going to put out an X, right? So, um, oh, also notice that there's an H there. Actually, there's a 1 apostrophe, I don't know if you can read that, but it says one apostrophe H, the H stands for hex, and the one apostrophe means it's one bit, right? This is actually the same format that Verilog uses. Okay, so how do I exercise these guys? Um, well, I'm gonna go over here and say clock, I'm gonna set up A as a clock, and I'm gonna give it a period of, um, um, ba, 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 ba. actually, yeah, one, two, four, 400 with a duty cycle of 200. Duty cycle is how long it's high versus uh, period is the repetition period. Um, oh, I guess 50%, duty cycle is 50%. I forget how this works, hold on, 400, yeah. Okay, okay, did that work? Let me test it out. Run, run, run. Oh, there we go. Oh, it works. Look at that. Look at A. Look at it go. Okay. So then um, B, I can set that guy up, clock. I'm going to set him up with a period of 200, uh, duty cycle 50. I'm going to set C up with a period of... Now, notice I'm saying clock, but they're not clocks, obviously. They're, they're signals. I'm just using the clock functionality. And then I can run this guy. 
Okay, and there you go. So now I've got, because I've got three valid inputs, now I have an output value, right? And this should match with the slide hat on it. Okay, any questions? Um, also, by the way, I can zoom in here and I can pan and I can set cursor. Like if I move the cursor value around, wherever this cursor intersects, it'll show me the state at that time, right? So this makes it, this is one way you can debug um, issues with your circuit. Okay, so, um, yeah, so anyway, when you're satisfied that it's working, you pass it to the synthesizer and the synthesizer is gonna spit that out. And you might say, wait, oh, wait a second. I see a problem. I see a problem with this because I've got, look, I should have an AND gate. I should have a three input <laughs> AND gate here, right? And a three input AND gate here and a three input AND gate here and a three input OR gate to combine all of those things together, right? Remember your order of operations, right? The reason that's not like that is because remember, the synthesizer also minimizes the logic, right? So what ended up happening was, is I got this simplified circuit. Is this the only sim simplified circuit that I could get from this? No, but it's the one that the, the book, this is from the book. I think they got it from either Cordis or um, I think they got it from sim Simplify, Simplify Pro. But a lot of synthesizers will give you a graphical structure for the code, right? It's kind of cool, but like I said, once you start getting multiple lines up here in the Verilog, this becomes unreadable very quickly. Okay, but in this simple example, it's kind of neat to look at it. You guys follow that? So this is, shows how you go from the behavior, the function to the, the structure. Uh, and inf unfortunately, I can't show you this, the physical. I mean, actually, I think I could, because in Cordis, I think you can have it do a floor planner where it shows you the FPGA and it color codes it, but it's just a bunch of blobs, colors. It's, it's not really useful. Um, unless you're trying to manually place things, which I've done that, but it's weird, I actually ended up with better performance by allowing it to do it, you know, unconstrained, you know, than trying to get involved with the place and route process. Okay, so um, now we're gonna circle back here a little bit because um, I blew through that stuff pretty fast. So let's talk a little bit in general about System Verilog. As I mentioned, it's case sensitive. Um, you can't have names that start with numbers, names being signal names or module names. Why is that? Uh, unclear, I don't know. But the reason I bring it up is because you might wanna, wanna have that because you might have, wanna have a two input mux called two mux, but that would be an invalid name. So you'd have to call it mux two. Um, white space is ignored, so you can go crazy with your formatting. Um, my student Charles was, was go, went crazy. He would have like input, tab, 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 logic, tab, 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 <laughs> name, comma, next line break, and everything would be line. In fact, you guys will see it because we're gonna give you a top level design for the FPGA a wrapper, and he actually wrote that. So you'll eventually see his, you'll, you'll probably notice like, oh God, who wrote this? Guy's, <laughs> guy's crazy. Um, but white space is ignored, and then it has the same comments that you have in C. Okay, so let's come up with, um, let's come up with a multi-level design now, right? So we still have, we have this thing called AND3, which is very similar to the example module, but now we're gonna write another module called my design, which instantiates AND3. So this is a two level hierarchy essentially, right? So I've got AND3, which creates an AND gate, and, and then inside that, I, um, I basically just instantiate the AND gate and connect it to internal signals, but then that's basically it. <laughs> so uh, my design has no inputs and outputs, so there's nothing, nothing will really happen here, right? Um, so the thing I wanted to show here though, is in this case, I've got these logic, these internal signals inside of my design called A, B, C, and N1. And so when I instantiated the AND gate, I just said AND3, module name first, then instance name, AND gate. This AND gate is only used for simulation. It, this is thrown away when you synthesize it because the hardware doesn't care what you name the module. It's creating a copy of that circuit, right? But in the simulator, you, you, you'll see this as part of the hierarchy, right? And then I can drill down into it and see what's inside that, right? In which case I'd see this stuff, right? Okay, um, and then here's, this is the one part that is kind of weird. 
Um, but for the, if you guys use Python, you'd probably be fine with this. But if you're not a Python programmer, you might have not seen this before. When I connect wires to the inputs and outputs of the module that I'm instantiating, I do it by saying dot the port name, which is Y, right? And then parentheses the actual internal signal I want to connect to it, right? This is how I hook my own signal N1 into Y. Now you might say, wait a second, why are you doing Y first? Y is supposed to be last. It doesn't matter. The order doesn't matter. In fact, and it's important that the order doesn't matter because a lot of these modules have like 100 I.O. ports, so you'll never keep them in order, trust me. So, um, so um, um, right, so basically the port name and then the actual signal name. Now you can leave the actual signal name blank, in which case you leave it unconnected. And if it's an output, that's no problem. But if it's an input, eh, you might get an error for that, unconnected input error, right? You guys with me? So basically I'm associating the ports with the internal signals, that's what I'm doing there. But the syntax is what's important. Make sure you, you, know, you understand that syntax. The dot is the port name on the thing that you're instantiating and inside the parentheses is the actual wire, right? Okay, Okay. so that creates a little bit of a weird thing though because um, let's say I instantiate an and I, I instantiate a design which I'm going to call NAND3 and in that design I instantiate the AND gate which is a module and I instantiate an inverter, right? So now I have three modules, right? I've got the AND3 at the top which I already showed you, then I've got the inverter which I added which is basically just inverts the input. But then I have the top level module. You're going to hear that word a lot, top level, because whenever you create a design, and this is the, what kind of sucks about Verilog, by the way. If I give you a Verilog design, say there's 20 files in there, 20 modules. If I don't tell you where the top is, then you don't even know where to begin looking at that. You don't even know where to begin the hierarchy. You know what I mean? You, you, you generally, you start with the, 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 the top, and then you kind of feel out the hierarchy, right? So you, you always have to say what the top level design is at least. So if I gave you a directory with these three files, you'd have to go through the files to try to figure out where the, where the, how the hierarchy is constructed. So NAND3 is the top of the hierarchy, and then it references those two internally, okay? And then basically you want to connect the inputs to the AND gate to the, the top level inputs to the NAND gate. Then the output of the AND gate gets connected with an internal signal that feeds into the input of the inverter, and then the output of the inverter feeds into the top level input Y, which creates these connections. So what ends up happening here is I've got inputs on the NAND gate and an output on the AND gate. The inputs are getting hooked into the inputs, the top level inputs. So a is connected to A, B is connected to B, and C is connected to C. Now you might say, well, that's obvious, isn't it? Well, yeah, but this A, sorry, that A is that A, but that A is that A, right? So A is different. I've got A at the top level, and then I've got A inside the AND gate, right? Now that, where it gets weird is here, because I have a Y on the AND gate. Boom, right here, right? Y is connected to my N1 signal. And then I'm going to subsequently take that N1 signal and hook it into the A input of the inverter, right? So the way that I hook these two things up, the way I feed the output of the AND gate into the input of the inverter is through the name N1. By having N1 here and having N1 here, I've effectively wired them together, right? Same way as in, if you ever use SPICE, like in your electrical engineering class, SPICE works the same way. In SPICE, you know, the node names are, you know, you have nodes in SPICE. Here, you have these variables that are essentially nodes, SPICE nodes, or you can think of them as, I like to think of them as wires, right? Okay, and then the inverter Y is the top level Y. Now, what ends up happening is I mentioned to you guys that when you synthesize this, it gets flattened. So these names go away, right? But the problem is, is there's multiple names because if you're inside the NAND gate, Y is the same as N1 is inside the NAND gate. It's the same wire, right? Except two different names, depending on 
what perspective you're looking at it in. If I'm in the NAND gate, I've got something called N1, but that N1 is the same actual wire as the Y wire inside the NAND, inside the AND gate, right? They're shorted. Same wire with two different names, depending on where you're looking, actually three different names, because it's also the same as A inside the inverter, right? So this wire has three names. It has, it's called Y in the AND gate, it's called N1 in the NAND gate, and it's called A in the inverter, but same wire, right? And they will always have the same state because it's the same wire. And when you drop it into the FPGA, it will physically be one wire, right? That's the problem, but it has different names because you gave it different names. That's, that's, that, that part gets really weird, especially when you wanna debug the hardware. There's a tool called Signal Tap that allows you to use the JTAG protocol to go in and actually monitor wires on the FPGA. But sometimes it's hard to find the wires because you don't even know what, the, what name they're going by because after it gets lower down, it gets flattened. Okay, make sense? Okay, and then, um, so I don't know what, the terminology is a little um, weird. In, in, uh, in VHDL, the connections you make, these connections, it's called a port map. And I know it's called a port map because remember I said VHDL is very verbose. You actually have to type out port map in the code in order to create these connections. Notice there's no English text here. It's just parentheses, right? That's the difference between Verilog and VHDL. But in Verilog, what is it called? I, I just call it a port map. I don't know what it's called. I don't know what this is called, right? It's basically pass by name, maybe, or port map. I don't know, right? It's connecting wires to ports, right? Um, and then, yeah, and then ports, I call ports is the, the IOs for a module. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, any questions about that? Okay, so as you might imagine, you're not always gonna be using single bits. You can also use multiple bit uh, names, variables, logic, wires. You can have multiple bit wires, which are not one wire, they're parallel wires, right? So if you declare something as logic three colon zero, that creates a four bit value. So I have A and B are four bit inputs and I've got five four bit inputs, right? So you might say, why three down to zero? Why not just bracket four? Also, why is the three down to zero before A and B and not after A and B as it would be in Java or C++ in an array declaration? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think one, one reason for that is because notice that I can make A and B both arrays by putting the, the array indices before A, right? I think that's one reason, but I don't know the whole history of that. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is that unlike every other language on earth where you have an array and the array bounds are after the variable name, you have to put them before in Verilog, right? Also, you have to put the limits. So in, if instead of four, you say three colon zero, right? You might say, what happens if you put zero colon three? Nothing, same thing. It has no effect whatsoever, but everyone always puts the most significant bit first and the least significant bit last but you can reverse them and it makes no difference. You might say, maybe it reverses the bits. No, it doesn't, <laughs> it has no effect. But everyone uses that notation, three colon zero for four. So number of bits minus one colon zero, right? Okay, um, all right, looks like I'm just about out of time.